good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, this morning we have uh, some special guests from America. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Pastor uh, President uh, Joel Kim. Uh, Joel is a very dear friend of mine. Uh, and he's a dear friend of uh, our church ministries in Southeast Asia. He's come many times to uh, Canada and Viet I mean Cambodia and Vietnam to serve the church. Uh, he's just, you can take one look at him and you know, he's very smart. <laughs> You're not sure about anything else, but you know he's smart. Uh, but we're just so grateful that he's uh, used his gifts so much uh, to prepare men and women um, for ministry in the body of Christ. Uh, I wish his wife was here. She's definitely uh, much nicer than his wife. But maybe uh, another time. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, Dr. Brad Wittner. Uh, he's a professor of New Testament at Westminster Seminary. And he uh, lives uh, uh, in California with his wife uh, Kathy and his seven children. They love the church throughout the world. And uh, because of that, they're a uh, very special guest for us. Uh, and uh, we just want to give them a warm welcome. So let's... <laughs> and we're just very grateful also for Westminster Seminary uh, that has uh, a vision not just for uh, the churches in America but for the churches throughout the world. Uh, 
Kemudian sebelah pujung nung kau te aku tak kau te tentai min nung sebelah pujung nung nung tu tiang pulu. With this, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Brother. This is my first time in Southeast Asia and I'm really excited to be here. We lived in Australia as a family and we lived in England uh, and now we live in California which is a different country but it's nice to visit you here in Cambodia. And I just want to say that we pray for you here. Two times a month on Friday at the seminary, we pray for the global church. And you all in Cambodia are in our prayers there. I teach New Testament and I have a special focus on the Apostle Paul. And I've done a lot of thinking and writing about 1st and 2nd Corinthians in the past years. And so I want to share something with you from 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 this morning. As I was praying about Second Corinthians four. As I was praying about what might encourage you, uh, I was thinking about this text because it encourages me right now. And so this is the topic that I want us to think about this morning. What are the reasons that Paul doesn't lose heart in his ministry? To lose heart, we could also say to be discouraged. And so, uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is very clear that this is on his mind. Just before we look at the text, can I pray for us, please? Our loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, the 
We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that you've forgiven us our sins. We thank you that you've given us a new life. We thank you that you are working to build up your church. And we thank you that you speak to us in your word. So please help us by your Holy Spirit this morning. To be encouraged. To understand why we don't need to lose heart in our ministry. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So really, I want us to think about um, uh, three things this morning. First of all, why could Paul have been very discouraged? What are all the reasons he had to lose heart? Secondly, why could we be discouraged? When we look at our ministries, why could we lose heart? And then finally, why should we not be discouraged? What are all of the many reasons Paul gives us in this chapter to be encouraged, not discouraged? Look at chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 16. Two times Paul repeats his theme. First in verse 1 he says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. And then again in verse 16, he said, So we do not lose heart. How can Paul say that? By all appearances, he should be very discouraged when he writes this letter before him. Think about what we know of Paul's ministry with Corinth. In Acts chapter 18, he plants the church there. He spends a year and a half with them in Corinth. He loves them. He preaches the gospel to them. And then God calls him to move on to a different place. And I want you to imagine with me, just for a minute, what Paul's support letter to his friends might have been like if he was writing to them about the ministry in Corinth. Yeah, look, uh, 
Imagine Paul sitting in Ephesus. And he writes, Dear friends, let me tell you about the mission work in Corinth. He writes, you know I planted the church there. But I've had some news by letter from the church at Corinth. There are problems there. There's division. Different groups are threatening to tear the church apart. We know this, of course, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And Paul keeps writing, and he says, there's also a lot of sexual sin in the church. Some people there can't control their bodies. And some things in the church are even worse than in the world. We know that from 1 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6. Paul continues. He says, there's also a lot of backsliding. People are compromising with the world. They're going back to the idol temples. And then I got another letter, says Paul. I had a report from my trusted helpers, Titus and Timothy. And even though I wrote to them about Christ and the gospel, there's still division. Relationships are being torn apart. This has caused a lot of grief in me and in those in Corinth. People that I've worked with, that I love, now we've been torn apart. There's a lot of emotional distress. We know this from 2 Corinthians chapter uh, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, for example. And then there are people criticizing me, says Paul. People who are opposed to my ministry. The so-called super apostles. <laughs> From 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And they poisoned the people against me. They, they said I don't love you. 
Otherwise, they say, why wouldn't he come to us? Why does Paul stay away from us? 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So Paul writes in his letter to his supporters. The church isn't doing so well. But we come to chapter 4. And Paul says, but I'm not discouraged. And we might expect him to give a list of very positive things. And there are some positive things here. But actually there are more reasons why Paul could be discouraged. Look at verse 2. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Some people, Paul says, are using worldly, manipulative ways to try to do the ministry. But Paul's not going to do that. In verses 3 and 4 he goes on. And he says there's a real spiritual problem as well. The people are spiritually blind. He says in verse 3, our gospel is veiled, they can't see it. And in verse 4, he gives the reason for this. This is a spiritual blindness from sin and from Satan. He says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He says, people don't see, they don't understand. We preach the gospel and we teach God's word, but it seems like nothing happens for a lot of people. There's spiritual opposition here from Satan. Paul goes on that in verses 8 and 9. And sometimes here we jump too quickly to the second part of each verse. The second part of each phrase, rather. Yeah, 
But notice what he says in the first part of each phrase in verses 8 and 9. He says, we are afflicted in every way. We're perplexed, confused. We're persecuted. And we're struck down. The language that Paul uses here is really interesting. He describes himself almost as if he is an ancient Roman gladiator. He uses like explain what gladiator is. Sorry, uh, an ancient Roman fighter in the arena. So thousands of people in a stadium watching. And they bring in two fighters. And they're supposed to fight until death. And Paul uses the language that's attached to one of these kinds of fighters. And he describes himself as if he's taking blow after blow. He's being, he's, he's not winning this fight. Where you could think of a modern boxing match, perhaps, a fight in, in the ring. And Paul is against the ropes. He's taking hit after hit. And makes Paul very conscious of his mortality, that he's going to die. In verses 10 to 13, he uses the word death four times. He knows that he's human. He knows that he's very weak. He's probably sick much of the time. He has a dying body. And his, his health problems are made more difficult by his struggle in ministry. In chapter 11, he'll talk about this even in more detail. And he says something very interesting in chapter 11. One of the things that wears Paul down the most, according to chapter 11, verse 28, is his constant anxiety for the churches. 
He prays for them every day. He's worked hard to proclaim the gospel to them. But he knows that they're really struggling. And so when we come to the end of our passage in chapter 4, in verse 16, how does Paul summarize all this? He says, Our outer self, our outer man, is wasting away. My outer man, Paul says, is being destroyed. Paul's own body feels like it's falling apart. And sometimes when he looks at his ministry, it seems like his ministry is falling apart. So if we think of Paul writing a letter to his supporters back home, do you think the people reading that letter would be encouraged to hear from Paul? There's a lot here to be discouraged about, isn't there? We could understand if Paul said, I'm discouraged, I'm losing heart. And I, want, I want to have us think for a minute together about our ministries now. What about us? What about you? Are there things here that resonate with your experience in your ministry? When I taught for six years in England, some of my uh, some of my British friends would accuse me of being an American optimist. Sometimes Americans are not very good at looking difficulty in the face as realists. And I don't mean to come here to discourage you today. Which is why we're going to end on Paul's positive note. But before we get there, what about some realism? What, re what, what resonates with you? 
Let me list some of the problems that we've seen in Paul. Division in the church. Dysfunction in the church. Problems. People aren't growing spiritually. Relationships are broken. Personal attacks on character. Attacks on your commitment. Doubts about your ability. Spiritual blindness and opposition. Confusing and complicated situations. A sense of, what should I do, Lord? How do I even begin with this relationship? What, what should be my strategy, my next steps? In, in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you if you'd like to share with us some of the things that are challenging for you right now. But while you think about that, let me share a little bit about my ministry right now. As Paul said, my, my main job is teaching at the seminary. But I also serve as part-time pastor of a Spanish-speaking church in California. We're a very small church. Some weeks, maybe 30 or 40 people are there. Uh, our, our head pastor is Pastor Juan. He's been working to plant this church and establish it for 20 years. And he's had difficulty after difficulty. And last year, right as we were getting ready to have some progress, he got the news that he had cancer. And so he had nine months of treatments in the hospital. And then they thought he was clear of the cancer. And then two months ago it came back. So right now, today in fact, he's back in the hospital. And I was praying for him this morning because he's going through a final treatment again. And 
Despite his weakness and his cancer, he loves to come when he can and preach. He, he lost his hair, he lost 60 pounds. He's very weak. And in the meantime, we're trying to keep the church going. But we have all the normal problems of church life. We've got marriages that are being challenged and falling apart. We have some young people who are very committed and now they're fading away, it seems. We desperately need men who could be elders and help with the ministry. But it seems like every time we get close, we have to take two steps back. And then there are cultural challenges, at least for me. I can speak Spanish, but I'm, I'm not Hispanic by, by my background. So how do I help the people understand the way the gospel can change them and help them grow in their Christian life? To be very honest, it feels very discouraging. One of my one of my former colleagues uses this phrase. He says ministry life is full of multiple overwhelming. Here's a picture of what I mean. One time when I was younger and maybe stronger, I was swimming with some friends at the beach. And the waves were very powerful. And I thought, no problem, I can handle it. And suddenly, the way the waves came, it knocked me down. It slammed my face into the sand on the bottom. And every time I tried to stand up, another wave hit me. Again and again and again, wave after wave. That's what I mean by multiple overwhelmings. And that, I think, captures what Paul is also experiencing in his relationship with the Corinthian church. So can I ask you, if you're comfortable, 
What is the challenge for you along these lines right now? Some of you are pastors, some of you are teachers, all of you are trying to help build the church here in Cambodia. What are reasons that you have that feel discouraging as you look at your ministry? <laughs> Maybe there are no problems in the church. <laughs> So they are, they are being lied on. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yes, okay. that's right. I share. But at least he said that uh, sometimes he feels really lonely in ministry. Mm. Wasting your time? No, 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 please. I'm going to speak one hour. I've been serving in ministry. I've been serving a lot for 32 years now. ยังเสริมสัมพันธ์ครอลิงจูบลาพองไปเอ่อครอลิงจูบลาพองไปเอ่อครอลิงจูบลาพองไปเอ่อครอลิงจูบลาพองไปเอ่อครอลิงจูบ
Although Paul's going to give us many reasons that we'll look at briefly here. They really center around one thing in this chapter. Paul trusts in God who can raise the dead. Paul knows God personally and he knows what resurrection power can do. So let me highlight for you quickly some of the reasons Paul gives that he is not discouraged. Look at verse 1 again. Therefore, having or since we have this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Where did Paul get his ministry? It's a gift from God. It's by the mercy of God that he was commissioned to do this ministry. Paul knows what a great privilege it is to preach the gospel of Christ. And in verses 2 and 3, Paul has another reason that he's not discouraged. Paul has great confidence in the power of God's Word and the power of God's Spirit. God's spirit. He knows the message is foolish. The Son of God who died on a cross, it's foolishness in Corinth. And he knows his own weakness, his lack of ability in himself. There are others who seem to be using cultural ways of operating to, to get their ministries going. But Paul says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stick to preaching the word. And then in verses 46, he gives another very powerful reason. He says, God's glory can break through spiritual blindness. Paul knows that preaching the gospel is an act of new creation. Paul knows that preaching the gospel is an act of new creation. When he preaches Jesus Christ, dead people spiritually come alive. 
When he preaches Christ, sinners have their sins forgiven. When he preaches Christ, addicts are set free from their addiction. When he preaches Christ, people's lives are transformed. So Paul's not discouraged because he knows the power of preaching the gospel. And then in verses 7 to 12, he gives another reason. He says, despite persecution, in fact, especially in circumstances that are difficult, I might be dying, but God's power is working life through me. God works life through pastoral faithfulness, Paul says. So as our brother was saying, you keep going, we keep going, we keep going. And we know what feels like death for us, what is death for us, is life for God's people. Paul says that he knows a sustaining power even in the middle of difficulty. A power that keeps him going. Some of that is that he sees the result. He can glimpse the result. He can see the connection between the difficulty of his ministry and the spiritual life that they have. And the life, the spiritual life they will have. But it's also because Paul knows now in his life the presence of Christ by his spirit. And in verses 13 and 14, Paul does something else. We know Paul depends on the Old Testament a lot. But here in verse 13, it's one of the shortest Old Testament quotations Paul ever uses. Verse 13 says, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak. What's Paul quoting from? He's quoting from Psalm 116. And Psalm 116 is a cry to God in the middle of difficulty. Psalm 116 
It's one of our family's favorite psalms to sing together. Here's how Psalm 116 begins. Paul says in, in the opening verses of 116, I love the Lord, sorry, not Paul, the psalmist says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. And then in verse 10 of the psalm, we see what Paul's quoting. Verse 10 says, I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. Uh, verse 10. Verse 10. Yeah. Uh, not exactly What's Paul doing, quoting from this psalm? The psalmist says, I believed and I spoke. And Paul says, I believed, so I spoke. Both of them are in situations of distress and difficulty. Both are being persecuted. But the psalmist says, here's what I'm saying, I am afflicted, Lord. But Paul changes it a little bit. Paul, Paul seems to be saying, yes, I am also afflicted. But despite my affliction, this is what I speak. I speak about the gospel of Christ. Paul's speaking is not crying out about his affliction. Paul's speaking is his proclamation of Jesus Christ. And he tells us why he does this in verse 14. He says, it's because I know that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Yeah. 
So how can Paul be confident in these circumstances? It's because he personally knows the resurrection power of God in his life. And he sees that resurrection power of God at work in their lives. And he knows that God's going to bring him and them together to the end. And then in verse 15, Paul almost starts to sing, I think. One commentator says this is a, a tremendous symphony of thanksgiving here in verse 15. <coughs> a concert or a song of thanksgiving. Paul says, For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So even though there are so many problems, Paul's encouraged when he looks at them. He can see the evidence of God's grace overflowing in their lives. He can see the gospel at work. It might be slow, but it's working its way through them. And he says that as they experience God's grace in Christ, one of the greatest encouragements to Paul is that they are thankful. It, it increases thanksgiving as it works its way among them. And the way Paul talks about this here, we know what he means by their gratitude. In the context of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, we can say very specifically what this Thanksgiving looks like. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says that the thanksgiving sounds like singing, it's praise. The songs they sing of praise. Paul's encouraged because he knows they join together their voices to sing praise to God. And in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 1, this, this gratitude looks, it takes another form. 
It's Thanksgiving that takes the form of prayers for one another and for Paul's ministry. So Paul knows there are some praying for him and he's encouraged. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, there's another form of gratitude Paul points to. That's the fact that they are giving money, giving financial gifts to support his mission. They're willing to give money to support the poorer saints back in Jerusalem that Paul's going to. And so Paul says, for all of these reasons, the, the singing, the prayers, the giving money, I'm encouraged because I see God's grace at work in you. I see this overflowing gratitude. And it encourages me and glorifies God. And so finally Paul comes to verse 16. And he says again, so for all of these reasons, we don't lose heart. And he adds this in verse 16. Though our outer man is wasting away, our inner man is being renewed day by day. And the verb Paul uses for being renewed is one of Paul's Holy Spirit verbs. This is, this is something the Holy Spirit does. Paul knows the Spirit's presence because the Spirit renews him day by day. He might be physically weak, but he's spiritually encouraged. Because it's the power of the Spirit that works the power of resurrection. And then Paul ends by, by lifting his eyes to, toward the future. He says this in verses 17 and 18. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. <laughs> Sustainer of 
Paul's looking to the future and he sees these are the things that are going to last. The lives that are being transformed by the gospel. But that perspective on the future also changes his perspective on the present. The things that Paul can see with his eyes are part of this old creation. But there are things that he can't see with his eyes which are already happening now. God's power has broken into his life and the life of the people that he preaches to. And it's God's resurrection power in the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul is most encouraged by. And that's what I think we need to remember in our ministries too. Because we know how difficult it can be. We've already faced a lot of struggles. And I'm sorry, but I can guarantee there will be more to come. You may never want to ask me back. <laughs> but despite all of that realism about the difficulty, we can say with Paul, we do not lose heart. Because of God's resurrection power in Jesus Christ, So, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you this morning. Keep going. Keep going. Don't be discouraged. Don't let each other become discouraged. With Paul, let's remind one another of all the reasons we have to be encouraged by God's power. Uh, to be encouraged by God's power. And as we keep going in our ministries, to, to continue to cry out to God, to continue to depend on Him, but to continue to be faithful, especially in the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Let me pray once more for us. Our loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks once again in the name of Jesus Christ. For the example of the Apostle Paul. We thank you for this man who knew what it was like to suffer. But we thank you for sustaining him, helping him to keep going in his ministry. And we thank you for speaking to us through his words. We thank you for pointing us to the new creation power in Christ Jesus.
nhưng chúng họ cũng không có ông đại ca ông ban chúng họ bằng hai dương kiều ai khơi ông pi prichesta rồi bảo phong và yesu được nâng cao cai trai dương chúng chỉ thay lời we confess lord that we easily become discouraged ta ơi dương kiều bất chi sao thiên tha dương kiều nghe được nâng cao đại thật thực chất you know all that we face in our ministries ta ông chia sẻ cả đời ông đại dương kiều bởi chôn bốc được nâng cao cai trai dương kiều you know the difficulties and the challenges and the weakness ta You know our own sin and the sin of the people that we love and minister to. But we pray that for the sake of Christ, you would forgive us our sins. And that you would encourage our hearts. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here today. That you would lift them up and encourage them. That you would draw near to them. That they would know in their own lives the resurrection power and presence of your Holy Spirit. That they would have eyes to see the encouraging signs in their ministries. And that they would trust in your plan and your power. And so we pray that the gospel would go forth in Cambodia. And that the church would grow. And that thanksgiving would overflow for your glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. So maybe you've seen on television some very good-looking American preachers. Not like me. <laughs> That's one of the things I think Paul's referring to. It's, it's not about how good I look as a preacher. It's not about preaching in ways that manipulate people's emotions. 
At one point he says, I'm not like a peddler in the marketplace trying to get people's attention with flashy things. So we don't have to use the tools of marketing. Now, Paul's not opposed to using wisdom in the ways that we get the gospel out. But he's concerned with the simple, understandable preaching of Christ to people. We don't have to use big multimedia presentations. We don't have to have lots of lights and big events. We don't have to promise things that aren't true. We don't have to say, this is going to transform everything about your life right now. Paul says, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to preach Christ. So I think those are some of the things that, that I, I would see here in Corinthians. Does that help a little bit? We are a pastor and a church planter. We want to plant more church, we want to see church grow. But it's somehow church still the same, not grow, we be backward. So, what is what we do? What's your strategy? Uh, what is the strategy uh, to make it progress and grow more? Okay. Maybe it's face uh, some kind of situation. ចាហើយលោកគ្រូសួរតាមខ្ញុំនិយាយជាតាមពុជំនុំខ្ញុំនិយាយជាគ្រូកុំវិលចាហើយនិងឃើញថាកោដល់ឲ្យយើងចង់
He never says leadership. He always says service and ministry. So it's really important for Paul the way that we see ourselves. We don't, of course we have to lead, but we don't see ourselves as worldly leaders, we see ourselves as servants and ministers. And Paul never really says church growth like we think of it. Instead he says, how do I build up the church? And in some ways, I like to think of 1st and 2nd Corinthians as an unfolding blueprint for a new building. The, the church is clearly a building in the Corinthian letters. So right from the beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what kind of building is the church? It's a holy temple. And Paul says some very specific things about how do you build that temple up in ministry. And then at the very end of 2 Corinthians, he says it again. In chapter 10 and chapter 13, he says, God sent me not to tear you down, but to build you up. Chapter 10 So, sorry, I'm changing your question a little bit here. I think Paul's question that he wants to answer is, how do we faithfully build up the church? Sometimes that means new churches are going to be planted. Sometimes that means through evangelism, new members will join our existing churches. But there are different seasons in ministry. And Paul says no matter what season you're in, you have to build the church up. And especially from the, from the Corinthians, I think there are, let's say, four things. Uh, I'll start with four, there might be a fifth. Four things that he says that should inform our strategy. You always, always, always point to Jesus Christ. It sounds very basic and simple. But Paul doesn't mean just repetitive, don't, don't just repeat the name of Christ. 
Help people understand more and more what the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Christ actually mean in their lives. So Paul can't stop saying the name of Jesus at the beginning of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 1, in 9 verses, 10 times, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And so the first way he says you apply this is you help people understand why they should be grateful to Christ. If we're preaching the grace of God in Jesus Christ, the gift that God gives, then we have, we'll, we'll help people to be thankful, to be grateful. Sorry. If, so Paul says, preach the grace of Christ. And help people understand why they should be thankful. This is the foundation for the building. And then he says, don't stop, go back to the cross again. Keep pointing to the cross of Christ. Because it's there that you see the wisdom of God. And slowly and patiently help people understand that. Paul, Paul says there's, there are riches in Christ in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Such riches. A treasure. And he says it quickly, but we should say it slowly. He says, what does it mean that Christ is our wisdom? It means he's our righteousness. Wow, take some time to help people understand that. He's our sanctification. What does that mean? How does Christ help me to grow in holiness? Christ is our redemption. What does that mean? How does he set me free? So Paul says, preach Christ. Preach the cross of Christ. And slowly, patiently unpack that for your people. And when you, when you do that over time, you're going to build up the church. Going to build up the church. In, in two important ways. One, you build the church up in gospel comfort. Peace. 
And the other is you build the church up in gospel holiness. So I could go on, sorry, but I think actually that's that's Paul's pattern for building up the church. There are lots of other strategies we can think about. But faithfully preaching Christ and helping people understand the That's the gospel that brings comfort and peace in life. And that's the foundation from which we grow in holiness. And that's going to grow the church. Yeah. So we have been preaching about Christ, but what do you mean by preaching about Christ? Because we have been preaching about Christ. So what do you mean? Here's what I think Paul means. Paul means you start by helping people understand the cross and the resurrection. So what does the cross mean? It means my sins can be forgiven. But it also means that I, that I have a righteousness from Christ. And these are both difficult things for people to really understand and grasp. And so over months, over years, I have to try to make sure that my people really understand this in more detail. So let me give you a very quick example. Uh, a church that I worked at as a pastor at 20 years ago in Boston. There were some people who had been Christians for many years. They, and they, they understood that their sins were forgiven in Jesus. But the more I got to know them, and had a Bible study with these men, and went to visit them in their homes, I realized that they didn't understand something really important. They didn't understand that not only were their sins forgiven, but they also were righteous in Christ, justified in Christ. These men thought, my sins are forgiven. And now I need to do my best to grow as I have to work harder and harder and harder at the Christian life. But they thought they could do that in their own power. But 
And I think one of the things Paul is very clear about is that's not going to work. They needed to understand that they, they had new clothes as well, right? They, were, they had righteous clothes in Christ. They, they needed to understand that Christ's Spirit was at work in them, helping them to grow in and to draw Paul again from chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, uh, we can see another, another way that he applies Christ and unpacks this for them. It's to help people have a new way of thinking about their identity. Paul says, look, you used to be all kinds of different sinners. Some of you were murderers. Some of you were thieves and stolen. Some of you were in sexual sin. But then he says in, in chapter 6, verse 11, something really beautiful. And, and we can almost hear Paul preaching off the page at us here. He says, but you were washed. Chapter 6, verse 7. First Corinthians, sorry. Chapter 6, verse 7. Chapter 6, verse 7. So he says, such a, some of you were these things, yeah. but you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And in our English translations, we only get one but. I don't know about it. Are there one or are there three buts? Only one. Oh, but you have three buts. What Paul writes is not just, he writes three buts, yes? So, but you were, but you were, but you were. So he repeats this three times. And he does so in a way that is emphatic. Not really strong. In fact, uh, forgive me for getting technical for just a second here. Let me get very specific. What, what Paul writes in the Greek here is really striking. He's so excited he, he makes a grammar mistake. Actually, it's, it's not a mistake, but some of the editors have cleaned it up in our in our Bibles. What he does is in Greek uses the full form of the word but. Uh, 
which he shouldn't use because of the way the next words start. I'm sorry, this is a little technical. And if, you're, if you're looking at your Greek text, you won't see it. Uh, you won't see it in your electronic Greek text because they've cleaned it up. But the oldest copies of the Greek Bible keep it there. And but, Paul says it's like capital letters. But, but, but you are not what you once were. What you once were, you now are not. And that's because of the, that's because of Christ and His Spirit. And so that's another way Paul says, slowly, slowly, help people understand their identity has really changed. I can't think of myself like I used to do. I can't describe myself like I used to. I have really been made new in Christ. And on the basis of that, then Paul starts to tell them how they can grow in holiness. So I, I, I hope that helps a little bit. I think it's a slow, patient explaining and, re and reviewing and applying to people's lives. It's not just a boring repetition of Jesus on the cross. Instead, it's it's trying to it's trying to take what one person says, take take the diamond of the gospel and turn it a little bit, turn it a little bit more, turn it a little bit more in the light and help people see all of the different facets of that diamond. But not to do so in a way that helps people understand the grace of God. It's a kind of preaching that mentions the cross and then moves very quickly to obedience. But it doesn't help people see the connection between the work of Christ. There's another one that preaches Christ as a way to improve our lives or to maybe even get rich. To improve our lives. That we, that we believe in Christ so that He helps us to be healthy, to have good life. But 
So I think those are some of the ways that I see, at least in, in our context, in our, in where I live. I don't know about here. Believe in Jesus and you will get money. Yes. One more question. So go with it. One more question. We can smile a good one. Most of us are facing similar with preach until congregation for the school. Oh. And they are, they are not despised or wake up and commit their life to serve together with the pastor. And the pastor is in that group alone. And most of the pastor want to pick up. So why congregation is not inspired and commit their life to serve together? And for a pastor will be gone, congregation will be gone, the church will be gone. So, how can let me rephrase it to make sure I've got what you're asking. How can pastors get the congregation involved and growing in the work of ministry? Is that? I think actually the book of Romans is really helpful for us here. How, how does Paul do that in Romans? Because by the time you get to the end of Romans, in Romans chapter 15, he's trying to get people excited about joining in the ministry. He says he wants people to encourage one another and serve one another. He wants people to give money for the mission so he can go to Spain with the gospel. He wants, he wants the church to keep growing with Jews and Gentiles, people from different backgrounds together. He wants, he wants them to sing praise together so that it echoes. So how does he lead them there? What comes what come, what does he do in chapters one to fourteen to get us to chapter fifteen in Romans? I'm afraid this is going to be a boring answer. <laughs> he talks about sin. So they understand how bad sin is. He talks about grace. Grace in the gospel of Christ. He talks about the Holy Spirit. And he helps them understand how the Spirit is at work in their lives now. In other words, he leads them through a theology of the gospel of grace. And 
and after at least 11 very theological chapters, then in chapters 12 to 15, he says, this is how you need to get involved. This is your obligation. This is what it looks like to have a healthy, growing, serving church. This is what it would look like if we were sending missionaries and planting other churches and yeah. seeing conversions. So he, start, he starts with spending a lot of time on the gospel. One last question. Yes, no we're, making, we're making it work too hard. It's alright, I can earn my lunch. Some of you can earn you can earn you can earn you can earn you can Yeah.